and we are live. Great. Welcome, everybody. We're going to give it just one minute for people to log in. We're getting, you can see our participants ticking up. One minute. We'll get it. We'll get things started. Okay, great. Thank you everybody for joining this Dialogue Across Differences, a Columbia University's Climate School hosted event. Um, my name is Jessica Fonzo. I'm a professor of climate at the Columbia University Climate School at Columbia University in New York City. And today we're gonna be delving into the scientific and political quagmire of animal foods for human and planetary health. And this event is part of a larger series that is hosted by the president of Colombia, Manu uh, Shafiq, to foster more dialogue on some controversial issues where there's many different sides, many different complexity, and many different solutions. And today we're going to focus on the issues of animal source foods. Animal source foods have become quite controversial with divergent interpretations of the scientific literature and intractable value judgments concerning their consumption for human and planetary health. Producing animal source foods can tax land, it can tax biodiversity and water resources and drive rising greenhouse gas emissions, depending on the kind of animal system in which these animals are raised. To lessen the impact of these foods on the environment and climate, some nutrition and climate experts have suggested that we meet global nu nutrition requirements with more plant-based diets. And we should limit the consumption of animal source foods, particularly those associated with diet-related non-communicable disease risk. Others propose that limiting animal source foods uh, may not provide all the necessary nutrients for human health, and eliminating these foods among key populations could be detrimental for growth, development, and health, particularly in poverty-stricken environments in which infectious disease burdens can be taxing on biological systems. There's also the issue of livelihoods. Many depend on animals for income generation and preserving long-standing cultures and traditions of humans and animals living in kinship. So this is difficult. It's a difficult issue. We can't disentangle how difficult this will be to fulfill the nutrient needs of 10 billion people living on this planet. We have massive injustices and inequities in people's ability to access healthy diets. With the current business as usual response to climate mitigation and climate related extreme events and continued environmental constraints and degradation, Raising animals and foods to feed them will become even more complex, further exacerbating inequities. So we're gonna delve into this topic in the next hour. So I just, for a couple of housekeeping for, I introduced my fantastic guests who are gonna solve this issue in the next hour. Um, I'd like to encourage you to put your questions in the Q&A um, and we'll try to get to them in the last 10, 15 minutes of this, of this webinar. So thank you all for joining. I'd like to introduce my panelists. Let me begin uh, first with uh, Dr. Laura Iannotti. Uh, she's a professor at the Brown School in Public Health and founding director of the E3 Nutrition Lab at Washington University in St. Louis. Her lab aims to identify nutrition solutions that embrace principles embodied in the three E's, equity, environment, and evolution. Uh, Dr. Iannotti is very well known for her work looking at sustainable healthy dietary patterns that improve young child growth and brain development. She's done work in Ecuador, Haiti, and Madagascar. It's such a pleasure that I've gotten to know her work over the years. She used to be at Johns Hopkins, as was I, um, and uh, she's absolutely a fantastic nutritionist and, and has done a substantive work in, in the area of animal source foods and human health. Next, we have uh, Robin Alders, also someone who I've known for a very long time. We've been together in different places around the world, including Timor-Leste, which is close to her, but far from us. 
Uh, Robin's a veterinarian and an honorary professor at the Australian National University Development Policy Center, the Australian National University Institute for Climate, Energy, and Disaster, Solu Disaster Solutions, and the Department of Pathobiology and Population Sciences at the Royal Veterinary College in London, and the Veterinary Department of Infectious Disease and Global Health at Tufts University. She's also a senior fellow at the Chatham House Global Health Program. For over 30 years, Robin has worked closely with smallholder farmers and producers in Sub-Saharan Africa, South and Southeast Asia as a veterinarian, researcher, and colleague. She's done some incredible work looking at sustainable infectious disease control in resource-limited areas, wildlife conservation, and she's done a lot of work with women as well, women smallholder farmers. And Robin herself is a farmer. She considers herself small scale, <laughs> small scale for Australia. She's a, she's a sheep farmer, which is, is fantastic. We also have Donald Moore. He's the executive director of the Global Dairy Platform based in Chicago, and he serves as the chairman of the Dairy Sustainability Framework and as a leader of the Pathways to Dairy Net Zero Initiative. And he's a member of the Global Agenda for Sustainable Livestock Guiding Group. He also is a past chairman of the International Agri-Food Network and he's very involved in the private sector mechanism to the UN Committee on World Food Security. The Global Dairy Platform is a really interesting body. It's a non-for-profit industry association representing the global dairy sector. Its membership includes over 100 leading cooperatives, companies, associations, scientific bodies, and partners that have operations in more than 150 countries. And incredibly, this group collectively produced more than a third of all the world's milk. Very interesting. Great to have you, Donald. And last, we have Mario Herrero. He is a professor at Cornell University. He may not be able to turn his camera on because he's going through security in Ithaca's airport. <laughs> he's a professor in the Department of Global Development and the Director of Food Systems and Global Change. He's a Cornell Atkinson Scholar and a Nancer and Peter Minig Family Investigator in the Life Sciences. His research is wide ranging. He focuses on increasing the sustainability of food systems for the benefits of human and ecosystems. He's worked on uh, climate mitigation adaptation, long time on livestock systems in Sub-Saharan Africa, true cost of food, sustainability metrics and healthy and sustainable diets. I've worked with Mario for a long time. He's my partner in crime on many different uh, projects that we have ongoing. So it's a real pleasure to have Mario as well. So thank you all for joining and let's get into the dialogue. So I'm gonna ask you all first, if you could briefly uh, state what you think is the most controversial issue about animal source foods and why it's so controversial. And I'll start first with you, Robin, and then Donald, Laura, and then Mario. Thanks so much, Jess, and, and thanks for the invitation to be here. It is a really important discussion. And um, when you pose the, the question, you know, what's the most controversial? In my mind, I couldn't decide whether my answer is controversial or whether I think it's um, just a little bit sad, but I, I think we need to start with the basics. And so as a veterinarian, you know, during our training, we do comparative anatomy, we do comparative physiology, and we learn about what we need to do to nourish the different animal species. So today we're focusing on nourishing humans, but to understand what's appropriate for humans, I think it's also interesting to think about what do we need to nourish animals and why does what we eat and what do different animals eat why does that vary? So if we look at our anatomy very simply, so I'm here on my sheep farm, as you said, and my sheep are very happy out there eating grass, very happy to be herbivores. And uh, and that's because they have, you know, millions and millions of bacteria in their room and helping them. They've got, uh, in US speak, 85 feet of small intestines compared to our 25 metres so they've, they've got a system that's designed to help them extract the water and the nutrients they need from that uh, herbivorous diet that they're on. If we think about some of our primate cousins, like a gorilla, also a herbivore, but their digestive system's completely different. Their digestive system is like a horse. They have a very large 
um, large intestine where their fermentation takes place. So for me, if we're going to talk about what we need to eat and what's going to be the most efficient way to nourish people, it's important to think about what our digestive system is how it looks and how we can most efficiently nourish that. And, and in my experience, and particularly for women and growing children, uh, a, a diet devoid of animal source foods puts life their lives at risk. It also makes it a much more inefficient diet because you have to eat a lot more and you require supplements. That was a long answer to a simple question. Sorry about that. That's great. No, I think the controversy is us not remembering our basic biology. <laughs> Donald, what's yeah. the most controversial thing in your well, mind? I, I guess, you know, Jess, if, if we're asking this question of a great group of people, someone's going to say it's animal welfare, it's environment, it's health concerns, or it's cultural or economic um, concerns. But I guess to me, it all depends on what lens you look at this through. You know, those of us who live here in the well-fed West, which is about 12 percent of the world's population, will probably focus on environmental outcomes or, or health outcomes, whereas those who are living in emerging or developing markets will have an entirely different perspective on this. As you said in the introduction, I represent the global dairy sector, you know, and those of us who live in the US tend to think of dairy as a relatively large scale operation. The reality is globally, there are 133 million dairy farmers in the world with an average of three cows per farm. So this is an industry with some large scale operators in parts of the developed world like we have here in North America, but then a very long tail of smallholder farmers all over the world who are working hard to survive, to nourish themselves and their family and to generate an income. And the way we would look at this is very, very different. I guess the controversy for me is that we often hear people talking about a simple solution to climate change, change mm -hmm. our diets, move towards a plant-based um, diet. And I think the, con the controversy for me is people are not considering how we will produce enough food in that environment to satisfy um, a growing world population. And the reason I say that is according to FAO, the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, two thirds of the world's agricultural land is permanent pasture, meadow or savanna, the sort of stuff that robins um, sheep are grazing on in Australia. Um, and the challenge there is we can't just take animal agriculture off the plate, remove two thirds of the world's um, uh, you know, productive uh, food system and still feed ourselves. We can't plow the savannas up and the meadows up and plant them in something else. So the question for me is really, how do we make culture as sustainable and as efficient as possible? So thank you, Jess. Thank you, Donna. We'll come back to that in some more detail. Laura, from your perspective. Yeah, first of all, <clears throat> thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this esteemed panel. It's really an honor. Um, I also want to say, you know, I, I am biased, but I agree. I think that this issue um, merits coverage in this series on dialogue across differences because it is so critical to many different you know, facets of health and planetary health. Um, I agree with Donald entirely that it really depends on the lens and it depends on who, what circles you're referring to in terms of the controversial question. In my public health, in our, I should say, Jess and, and myself, in our public health um, academic community, I think, I think we unfortunately have too narrowly a focused controversy around um, the health outcomes in adults with the NCDs, and I'll get into more, more of that later. I think um, in the broader public, I myself have been swept into research and the dialogue um, in animal source foods because of the controversy with regards to the environment and the contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. So I really look forward to this um, dynamic conversation and um, applaud you for for covering such a controversial issue. Thanks, Laura. Mario. Thanks, Jess. Uh, and thanks a lot for the invitation. And it's great to see um, the other great panelists, uh, uh, close colleagues. Uh, for me, the controversy is slightly different. 
I actually, I'm a livestock scientist. I've been for the last, you know, almost 30 years. And uh, the most recent controversies probably all related to what are sustainable levels of consumption of animal source foods. I would say that uh, it's not becoming vegan or vegetarian or uh, or, or having a, a, a tiny amount of animal source foods. And it's also not just to keep consuming as we are consuming, especially in high income countries. But you know, there's very little guidance and um, out there, mm. especially from the nutrition perspective. And it is problematic because in, in many cases, the all the different messages that we hear actually stifle action in many ways. And, you know, you and, and get people in, you know, in different bands, you know, us who have worked in low and middle income countries that know the importance of animal source foods for livelihoods and nourishment, and also those in, in high income countries where, you know, livestock, livestock contribute enormously to the to the agricultural GDP. You know, there's a lot of wealth in the industry, eh, but where maybe consumers are consuming a lot of animal source foods and perhaps beyond what's really required. So how do we come to, um, uh, to a middle where we actually can increase consumption in the places where it's needed and uh, reduce consumption in the places where we are actually over consumed? From an environmental perspective, I think that it's it's a lot clearer in in many ways. Uh, there's obviously you know misconceptions and and controversies as well, but certainly you know understanding uh, what is and how much should we consume animal source foods is probably the the current most significant controversy in in livestock industries at the moment. Great. Thanks, Mario. Maybe we can start there. We can start with that nutrition controversy. Um, and Robin referred to this as well as around these inequities of who gets access to animal source foods and the importance of those in, in low and middle income contexts. Laura, so there's real there's a lot of ongoing debate debate around consumption of animal source foods, what kind, particularly red and red processed meats, on issues of non-communicable diseases like cardiovascular health, for example. Are these foods in high consumption bad for you? And should we be limiting those? Maybe just start there from your perspective. Are they consumed, are we consuming too much of these in the West as, as Donald had, had framed it? Um, and are these detrimental to, to health? It's a, it's a big question people feel perplexed about it is it's and it's it's definitely um nuanced i think all of our panelists have already touched on the fact that context matters enormously mm -hmm. um that you know there are big differences in nutrition inequities in the globe in terms of you know um, high income versus middle versus low um, and that's really important for people to remember when we're thinking about um, making those recommendations. And Mario's entirely right that we don't really have great dietary guidelines saying exactly how much we should be consuming, um, in part because we don't have empirical evidence saying how much we should be consuming. I would start by answering that question, Jess, with we need to think about nutrition within the life course. So the other part of the controversy is we fo we tend to focus on adults, largely high income, and yet there are different nutritional needs within different phases of the life course. So the life course phase that I focus on is the first thousand days of life. So pregnancy, lactation, and then through the complementary feeding period. And in that period, you need um, animal source foods without doubt. Um, because of the bioavailability of certain nutrients and because of the presence of certain nutrients such as B12, um, long chain fatty acids, high quality proteins, animal source foods provide these nutrients in more bioavailable matrices. 
So our, as Robin was referring to sheep intestine, our intestines will absorb um, those nutrients and compounds packaged in a certain way in animal foods. And for a young child with a small stomach, for example, you need efficient forms um, to absorb those nutrients. Um, vitamin A is a great example in plant-based foods, beta carotene, carotenoids, and animal foods, retinol, which we absorb 12 to 24 times higher rate than in, in plant-based foods. Now, the answer, the other part of this, I would say, and you know, I could go on and on about the evidence, but I would say just simply, we do have pretty clear evidence to say processed red meats are not good for our health. So that's pretty clear that if there, if these meats have been altered in some way, that that will increase risk for colorectal cancer, um, for other forms of NCDs. That, that to me is not a controversy in terms of the empirical evidence. But other animal source foods, and Donald will speak to this much more eloquently, but dairy, for example, has positive benefits across the life course. I also want to say just one word just before I, you know, turn this over, but I think, um, you know, we, we focus on the early, the first thousand days of life quite often, but school-aged children and older adults also need animal source food. School-aged children for brain development, and the famous study from Kenya kind of affirmed that, but there are more, there's more studies that have shown the importance of animal source foods for school-aged brain development. But then older adults, and with the demographics globally, we should be paying attention to what animal source foods do in terms of reducing frailty, you know, in, reducing risk for sarcopenia and improving cognition. So I'll just end with, again, when we think about this, this question of health outcomes, we have to think of it not only by context, but by life course and the nutritional needs in that life course. So I'll stop with that. Great, thanks, Laura. And I'm gonna come back to you a bit more about some of your work with eggs and some of these other animal source foods that are so important. I appreciate you mentioning dairy as I'm sure Donald does too. Let's talk a bit about kind of the, the yin yang, like, okay, animal source foods are important, but there's this whole climate issue. So maybe first to Mario um, and Donald, Robin, feel free to come in and respond as well. Um, the issue is that livestock are one of the biggest contributors to greenhouse gases coming from food systems. And I'd like to follow up a little bit later on what kind of system are we talking about? Um, so we need to do something with the livestock sector, because as Donald had mentioned, there's going to be increasing demand for animal source foods, and that already is, has been happening over the last 30 plus years. So what innovative strategies can be adopted to mitigate the environmental impact of animal agriculture, like reducing methane emissions, uh, implementing sustainable land management practices, minimizing water usage, manure management? How do we, how do we deal with that? And is there controversy or debate on which strategy is best? So maybe, Mario, you can start us out, and I'd love for, for Donald and, and Robin to come in. Robin's already practicing some regenerative agriculture on her sheep farm. So maybe, Mario, start with you. Because we can't, we can talk about the diet piece, but we can't not talk about the climate piece. These, these worlds must come together. So how do we rectify this? Yes, absolutely. I, I completely agree with you. Uh, it's, it's, it's a two or three prong strategy, what we require. A, you know, and as you rightly said, there's no silver bullets. Uh, there's a, a, a range of options, both uh, applicable to different livestock systems, different species and different contexts, all having slightly different, uh, yeah, it's, uh, trying to get slightly different outcomes. So for example, still the, the best way of reducing emissions in, in low and middle income countries is, First, to try to increase productivity, uh, but then have uh, less but better fed cows. 
that is actually that will actually reduce the net greenhouse gas emissions coming from the livestock sector. You know, people in low and middle income countries struggle in the majority of the cases to have enough feed for their animals. So usually what you what you have is just a, a few indigenous animals that are a, really poorly fed. And if you if you could actually at least change some of those, get into better feeding practices first, and then actually get into a little bit of crossbreeding and get, get a whole package of uh, sustainable intensification practices, you could actually end up being able to uh, have a couple of well-fed cows rather than three poorly fed ones. And this will ultimately lead to a much better land use, uh, net emissions, uh, even improvements in, you know, probably you will yield less labor for some of the people. You will have more uh, marketable surpluses of, of meat and milk. And this could actually be one, one of the first, uh, first ports of coal. And I think that, you know, particularly for dairy. We've seen this working already in many parts of the world. You take the East African highlands, you take India, you take a range of uh, Latin America, you know, the, the success stories of, of where dairy have, mm. have act has actually intensified sustainably uh, and has actually produced more animal source foods at a lower cost for consumers and given significant benefits for, for farmers. But then on, on the other hand, you have uh, the high income countries where you probably need greater uh, technical solutions. And particularly for methane, several of those are emerging. You know, we have um, algae supplements. We have, we, there is the development of a potential methane vaccine. Uh, there is uh, other uh, anti-methanogenic compounds that we could actually feed uh, these cows, so they can obtain reductions in methane of at least, you know, 30%. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're seeing this in several of the trials. Mm -hmm. Circularity is another super important opportunity where we actually, you know, as Robin pointed out, you know, the beauty of, of particularly of, of ruminants is that they eat, they don't compete in the, with us uh, for food. Mm -hmm. So actually understanding much better uh, how to feed them resources that don't compete and food wastes and stoves and crop residues that could be fed to them, but not to us uh, would be great. But also, you know, pigs and poultry. Pigs and poultry are tremendous recyclers. And before BSC and all these other mm -hmm. things, you know, we've always through humankind have used animals to recycle uh, the things that we cannot consume. We've made estimates that if we actually used food waste to feed pork and, and poultry, we could actually, this could lead to about 20 grams per capita of protein. Hmm. That's not insignificant. Hmm. You know, if you think that a human needs a, a gram, well, you know better, I would say, but say a gram and a half a person, uh, you know, you're talking about between 15 and 25 percent of a, of the protein needs of, of someone. Uh, so we need to explore these kinds of opportunities. You know, I think also that we need to be much more conscious of 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 the land, the land use, its opportunity costs. Mm -hmm. We ask an enormous amount from the land. You know, mm -hmm. we want we wanted to do everything. Uh, feed us, feed animals, you know, sequester mm. carbon, uh, maintain biodiversity, all these things. And the land has been very gracious with us so mm. far. But we're really stretching its, uh, you know, its multiple uses. And we need to actually be a lot more careful and really understand what to use land for. And this applies also to, to animal source foods and and, you know, at the moment, we use 30% of the cropland area of the world to uh, feed, to produce grains for livestock. So, well, you know, which of these lands are you using matters a lot, a lot. And it's part of the mitigation uh, discussion that we need to have. 
Uh, I'll stop here to let That's Donald right. and Robin. Yeah, chat. Donald. And we have our colleague, Ermias Kebrab online as well, who's been pioneering and feeding algae to, to cattle and at UC Davis. So it's good to see Ermias online. Donald. Thoughts? I was going to let Robin go first, but I'm happy to talk next. Mm -hmm. And Mario's done a great job of uh, summarizing, you know, some of the opportunities and options that we have. What I would say about the dairy system is globally, we know all the good dairy does. We know what it does from a nutritional perspective. We know what that nutrition does for health. We know what dairy does for livelihoods, economic growth. We've got a report coming out with the UN about the impact that dairy has on, on women's empowerment, et cetera. So we know all the good, but we need to acknowledge that dairy, like all agricultural commodities, can and must do more to address the natural environment in which we operate. That's why a couple of years ago now, we launched a program called Pathways to Dairy Net Zero. We've actually done some work with Mario on this particular program, where we need to understand there is not one dairy system in the world. There are many different dairy systems, and the pathways that we need to take within each of those systems will differ markedly depending on, on the environment that they operate in. So, for example, in emerging markets, which are very high emitting, low yielding dairy systems, predominantly the interventions that are likely to deliver the highest, um, the highest reductions in emissions there have got a lot to do with feed. And it's not necessarily the amount of feed or the quality of feed, but the way the feed is presented. So feed water. Now, this is a stunning thing, but, you know, as we do a lot of work in Africa and places, sometimes people don't realize the importance of clean water and then just basic animal husbandry. And in pilots we've run in Tanzania, we have improved farmer uh, income by 29% and animal productivity by 25%, just with those three basic interventions, which led to a 19% reduction in emission intensity. Then in a more developed market, like say the United States, um, our, our emission profile here is very different to the emission profile in those pastoral systems, which largely about enteric fermentation. Here, it's a lot more about manure. And there we have opportunities, for example, putting in methane digesters. Mm. And Mario's mentioned, you know, the methane inhibitor products that are coming on the market. And it's good to see Hermes is on the call today because mm. he's probably one of the le world's leading experts, particularly in the asparagopsis area. Um, so we understand that there are different pathways. The other thing that, um, again, working with Mario, one of the things that we identified was that in the dairy system globally, about 80% of our emissions are coming from emerging markets. So we need to really focus on and help those countries to develop strategies and plans to reduce emissions in those markets. And a lot of that has got to do with, as Mario said, improving productivity, ultimately getting to the point where a farmer with two or three cows can see that improving productivity per cow is a better strategy than adding another poorly fed cow to his herd. So, you know, and then longer term, we start to change genetics and that's where we start to really get on a, on a you know, a sort of a productive cycle. Um, last point, I think Mario made this as well, is about the circular bioeconomy. Mm -hmm. So here in the United States, we drink orange juice at breakfast. What happens to the orange peel? It gets fed to cows. What happens to almond hulls? They get fed to cows. So the cow is an incredible upcycler, not just a recycler, but upcycler takes those low quality inputs and delivers us a really high quality protein and nutrient dense mix as a result. So I'm um, just in the interest of time. I'll leave it there, Jess. Great. Robin, what are you thinking? Thanks very much. Um, firstly, I'd like to say that climate change is a major issue. We do need to tackle it. And here in Australia, we're on the front line. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Terrible wildfires this summer, while some places are having extraordinary flooding, mm -hmm. areas that are flooding and frequency of flooding that we've never seen before. And interestingly, it's farmers in Australia that are actually leading, I believe, the research, and particularly family farmers who have that connection with their land. And they've seen that ways that we thought were the, you know, the ways we were encouraged to do either through our training at agricultural schools or agricultural textbooks or government tax breaks weren't actually working. And, and so when we start to look at what's happening in Australia, in fact, 
the greatest loss of soil carbon since colonization in Australia is on cropland. The estimates are that around 50% of soil carbon has been lost on cropland since um, uh, the, the British arrived. And we have an opportunity with livestock systems to try and sequester carbon to replace some of that. So crop livestock systems, but on much of Australia, we have only about 6% of land that's arable, suitable for cropping. We have a lot of rangeland here. And by using regenerative practices, moving to perennial pastures, managing livestock in a way that's going to be um, help to sequester carbon, but also good for promoting biodiversity. Uh, in addition to climate change, we're dealing with biodiversity loss. We're dealing with invasive species. So we have to manage multiple problems. And uh, from the little bit of work that I've done on my farm, I bought it in 2014. So we're now 10 years in. I'm close to being carbon neutral um, through uh, improved management practices with getting better soil organic carbon planting native trees and shrubs and managing cropland, uh, the, the pasture, to be able to e ensure that when it does rain, that water is soaking into the soil so that we're getting good, good hydration. So it's understanding that production system. But with um, the term circular bioeconomies has been mentioned. The, the signals for producers and the rewards for producers need to reward farmers on that basis. We're still using a 19th century pricing system. So you're paid by weight of dressed carcass or uh, certain parameters for milk. We're not paid for the quality of the nutrients and the efficiency with which it's produced. Mm. So the production systems can become more environmentally sound, but we need the economic signals there to reward those farmers that do that because a lot of them are doing it out of love right now. They're mm. not doing it because they necessarily make good money. I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, we'll come We'll come back to the ranchers and farmers, but maybe while I have you, Robin, let's talk a little bit about animal welfare. And this is a question I've posed to other people, including Mario. You know, it's it's going to be a hot world. It's getting hotter. You know, we had the hottest year on record, hottest summer on record last year. You know, what about animals? You know, it's going to be, I, I imagine it's going to be hard to survive if you're a big beast like a cow. You know, these beautiful big creatures that eat eat this grass and 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 the, are uh, enjoyed by by those that raise them and and those that eat them. Um, but it's straining for them, the heat. I can imagine. And, and, you know, with that, so what are you thinking? What what kind of measures can we put in place to ensure that animals are cared for, their well-being is being considered? Because I think in a lot of these debates, and you as a veterinarian, we don't talk enough about animal welfare in the global food system debate. Only when it comes time to One Health, avoiding zoonotic disease kind of things, right? But we're not, you don't see the welfare piece being brought up. And it'd be interesting to hear from you on on that. What what do we do? How do we make that more mainstream? What kind of innovations can we ensure that these uh, these animals are, are well cared for? What animal welfare is, is hugely important. And every, as every farmer knows, a happy animal is a productive animal. So in terms mm -hmm. of domestic livestock, Farmers do like to look after their animals as as well as they can. However, once again, it depends on market forces. So if we look at the intensive industry, um, be it um, monogastric such as poultry and pigs or, or very large feedlots, the, the intensive dairy herds, that's been driven by, by economics. And it's not necessarily going to be looking at the health of the individual animal, but it's going to be looking at overall economics at the herd or the flock level. So we do need, and once again, the, the bioeconomies will start to factor in measures of animal welfare. And in some countries, there are premiums that will be paid for certain production systems. For instance, uh, pasture-raised chicken um, you know, may get a premium. But in this cost of living crisis that we have, what I see in my supermarket is that it's uh, caged eggs that are much more common now because they're cheaper. And so it's a the challenge is getting that 
need uh, with people who are increasingly divorced from the systems that sustain them. And I'd have to say that it's not only about animal welfare, but human welfare. What we discuss is that, say, for a young person here in Australia, 40% of their diet is junk food, as the nutritionists call it, discretionary food. So it's not nourishing them. It's using enormous resources. It's contributing to greenhouse gas emissions and putting a huge burden on our healthcare system. So we, when we talk about welfare, I like the term one welfare, mm. happy people, happy animals, and also happy wildlife. So getting that balance um, does require investment and there's increasing, at least in high income countries, accreditation systems where farms and farm production systems can be graded and ranked according to <clears throat> The, the the practices on the farm and that then becomes transparent to consumers. Thanks. Laura, I'm gonna come back to you on 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 humans. <laughs> so you know there's a lot of talk about well if we want to drive high income countries towards less less meat consumption, more sustainable diets. What's your thoughts on some of these lower on the food chain meats and animal products. And it'd be great to hear from you on eggs, because I know you've studied eggs a lot. Um, it'd be great to hear from both you and Donald on plant milks, some of these alternatives. You know, what, what's your take on this substituting down, whether it's a small per, you know, portion of your diet towards some of these um, lower environmental footprint um, animal source foods? Good for health. Uh optimal, as good as red meat? What's your thought? I mean, I think generally, um, Jess, that we should be thinking in terms of the whole diet, right? We, in the, in the nutrition community, have started talking about dietary patterns. And that's really what we want to consider, um, especially in the context of, of the environment. You know, I think we should be equating diet diversity and biodiversity, not just equating it, but studying it in tandem. So using those ecological indicators that are used for biodiversity and applying those in um, human nutrition, like species abundance or richness, um, and that because that translates into human health. Um, I, so in terms of, you know, what animal source foods we should be consuming, it should be a variety and it should be the more mm -hmm. sustainable ones. Um, I think understudied um, foods, for example, might be insects. We haven't really had good conversations mm -hmm. about insects, and that could be great for iron and zinc, for example. I think, um, you know, fish, if done in a sustainable way, we studied this in Kenya and found that, you know, by promoting fish at lower trophic levels, caught in a sustainable way using modified traps, um, we protect the ecosystem and we protect human health. So there, there can be win-wins, I think, in this in these scenarios. And eggs are another example um, where we can keep the chicken alive and thriving, um, but continue to feed young children with eggs and, and show these important impacts depending on context. But I would like to go back to what Robin mentioned at the very beginning, which is, um, you know, feed matters for the quality of those animal foods too. So we need to think about the whole picture of, yeah. you know, the planetary health so that animals and animals are eating well, and that will translate into higher quality eggs. For example, we showed some differences in choline um, in, in eggs that were free range versus, you know, industrial produced. There are differences based on, on feed. Um, so there's, it's an important question to think about which animal source foods we're, we're, we're considering um, and how those impact ecosystems and the environment. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I mean, I think we're hearing from all of this conversation, nuance, you know, it, nuance, a lot of it's nuance. I'm going to ask a question that's from the audience, and then I want to come back to one more question. And feel free to put more in in that in the Q and A for the audience on how do we create more dialogue around these contentious issues. But the question from Lais Mia Shone, uh, a graduate of Johns Hopkins, Laura, 
Uh, <laughs> is any doubt in your minds that high consuming countries or slash individuals can derive health and environmental benefits from reducing animal source food consumption? What is stopping us from walking the walk in the well-fed West? Mario, what do you think? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a really complex problem I, in the sense that, uh, you know, we are pretty uh, behaviorally. It's really difficult to create these changes because of culture, because of, you know, we're used to eating certain things. Aren't we you on a keto to... diet, Mario? No, no, no <laughs> keto diet. No, no. Um, also, also, you know, it's, it's convenience in many cases. It is uh, all sorts of things related to the food environment that are preventing us to make these fundamental changes to the way to the way we consume. For urban consumers, you know, the, the issue of convenience is so big. Mm. And, and I see it even myself, you know, it's just so much quicker just to grab something, a, a roast beef sandwich from from the restaurant, the, the, from from the cafeteria, than actually go further and you know get my chickpeas with uh, with spinach and feta, for example. Uh, it's you know we need to change that, and then it's all about economics as well. It's all about economics. We really need to uh, to first of all uh, ensure that we we have uh, good incentives, good price incentives to each foods that are rich in nutrients that are different from uh, animal source foods in many cases. But but in general terms, let's think about the whole diet. Mm -hmm. We need to actually think of a, of those prices. And, you know, and for producers, it's exactly the same. You know, the economics are not working for us in the livestock sector to change, to become a carbon neutral. At the end of the day, you know, we don't have the incentives, the price incentives for creating positive change that Robin mentioned. And at the same time, the, regu the regulatory system also doesn't account for the true costs of food, for example. So if those two could be uh, in included, I think that we will go longer way. If you look at adoption rates of the key practices, we know technically what has to happen. But you know, still adoption rates are relatively uh, small. You get adoption of key practices at 20% mm -hmm. in 10, 15, 10, 15 years. That's too little to create the change that we actually that we actually need. But we need to seriously think, you know, what does what has the farmer and what has the, the producer of livestock products really supposed to do? And what are the real incentives that will make them uh, move towards more sustainable systems? I mean, I diverted your, your question okay. a little bit, but you know, it gets us into uh, one of the pink elephants in the room, which is the economics of yeah. of the life of livestock production. Great, Donald. There's a question from you from Sophia Vanderheim. You mentioned methane digesters to help reduce methane emissions at the agriculture level. While this would help in some regard, this wouldn't change the systemic way of how we consume. What are some ways we can reduce emissions that promote behavioral change needed to reduce soil degradation, deforestation, and water wasted from current ag production? Yeah, let me start by doing a Mario and not answering the question directly. <laughs> <laughs> and, then I, and then I'll come back to this particular okay. one. I mean, you know, I, I was fascinated in, in the previous discussion about, you know, consumption and what do we need to do to walk the walk and talk mm. the talk and so on. Yeah. We, we've got to remember, we're not machines. We don't eat just for energy. We eat for all sorts of different reasons, emotional reasons, cultural reasons, convenience, as Mario mentioned. And then the one that we constantly seem to forget is we also eat for joy you know there are things mm. that we consume that i'm not suggesting you eat ice cream every day but mm. there are times when eating ice cream is joy it, it it you know it conveys a certain emotion to us and we've got to understand you can't just turn around and say no you're not to consume 
bacon, you're not to consume eggs, you're not to consume ice cream, whatever it might be, because somehow that's um, that's not good. We need to understand why people are consuming the way they are. Um, mm -hmm. Jessica, I wanted to go back to a, a point you made earlier too. You asked about plant-based alternatives to dairy products. You made the mistake of calling them milk. Um, I'd like to just correct you on that. Sorry. What I wanted to say is I'm all in favor of them. To me, they are choice and we need to give people choice. And that comes back to this question about walking the walk, etc., where people enjoy those products. And I've got friends who, who love almond milk or whatever you want to call it. Great. If, you, if that's what you like, then consume it. But understand mm -hmm. what you need to then do within your overall diet to make sure that you're achieving mm -hmm. the right nutritional outcome. From my perspective, if we're going to feed a growing world of 10 billion people by 2050 or whatever it is, we need all of these tools at our disposal. And so I'm in favor of the, the plant-based alternatives. I think we need to offer people choice. Now, back to the question that was that was specifically asked. Um, and I better look it up. Um, uh, yeah, so methane digesters, they are a way that we can take waste from the dairy sector and convert it into energy, which then helps us to offset our uh, fossil fuel usage as well. It's not really about reducing the amount of consumption. Um, I think we've talked about some of the other alternatives for reducing consumption of, of animal sourced foods, but it's not a simple equation. It's not a simple, let's substitute one for the other. And I better leave it there, Jess, because I think we're running out of time. And may, maybe a question for Robin and one more for Laura, if you guys are brief, and then we'll just do a quick thing on cooperation. So uh, Robin Ermius asks, one of the major reasons people in low and middle income countries keep animals is risk abatement, cultural values, power, manure, manure burning or draft power for ag. So how we reconcile the need for those and environmental impact? Uh, absolutely. And I, I, it's a really good question. And I was pleased to see it there. Farms and farm production are complex enterprises. And when you have particularly draft animals, or in my case, sheep that produce wool, you're actually not, they're not there for, for meat initially. But if we're going to talk about using, say, horses or oxen for draft power, for pulling carts or plows, um, what is the environmental impact there compared to to me who hops on a plane and flies to New York? Mm. You know, let's put this in perspective. Mm. Those systems, those small scale and those very complex smallholder farming systems can be very efficient if they are properly rewarded for their produce. So a lot of the problem comes to farm gate prices. So I think it is, farming is complex. It's not just about producing food for people. It is about sustaining lives, cultures, and the diversity of animals. And, and, and while I can, sorry, I just want to say to Sarah and Mary, and she's in Texas, about insects. Uh, the Western diet, yeah. are we really well fed with our levels of obesity? Dietary diversity is now the worst it's ever been in, in the West. But in uh, terms of indigenous communities, tradi traditional communities, insects have been eaten. They remain delicacies and people do consume them and they are quite delicious if you know how to cook them. Thanks. Thanks, Robin. And maybe one last question for you, Laura, from Paul Galley. Is there reliable data that sheds light on the extent of any observed shifts in diets in the, quote, well-fed West relative to animal source food? So it's, it's a good question from Paul on data availability, dietary data. Um, are we seeing shifts at all? And, and are we able to capture those shifts in, in the kind of dietary data we collect around the world? There's, as you know, Jess, there are there FAO. Um, puts out data on, um, it's not exact consumption data, but we can look at trends. Um, and certainly the trends, it's interesting, the trends for red meat consumption have gone down. Um, uh, poultry and pig meat consumption has gone up, um, but it varies tremendously across the globe. And I, I think to answer the question about that threshold effect, 
we don't really have good evidence. We don't know, as Mario was saying earlier, we don't know, you know, exact quantities that mm -hmm. tip us into um, NCDs, uh, mm -hmm. chronic disease outcomes, or brain development in the case of children, growth in the case of young children. We don't have good data on exact quantities. And I, and I would love for that to be um, a priority in terms of how we, I will say, Recently, I was looking at um, fish consumption in the U.S. And um, very, very few of us, a very small percentage of us meet the dietary guidelines for two servings a day. So again, I think we should be thinking more broadly about which foods, um, which animal source foods we focus on and which animal mm -hmm. source foods we recommend and, and try to continue to, to think about it in terms of diversity. In our last three minutes, if, if you each could give a one minute or less idea of how do we create more open dialogue between the range of scientific opinion and scientists, um, professionals and working on farms, health professionals, policymakers and the public, how do we how do we create more open dialogue? I mean, this is one example. You know, maybe we can have a whole series of these where we get more and more people attending, but what are, what are some of your thoughts? Maybe Donald, we'll start with you. How do we, how do we really foster more open dialogue on these contentious issues? I think this was a great, um, great webinar series today, Jess, and congrats to you and the team at um, the university for organizing. I think one of the things that we've got to do is we've got to avoid um, the, the extremes of opinion and some of this and, you know, we know we can do more in agriculture. We know we can do more in dairy to tackle some of these challenges. But to a point Robin's made several times, you know, we've got to do it in such a way that we still protect the food system. And that's all about making sure that farmers at the end of the day receive, you know, rec recognition and reward for what they're doing. Without farmers, there is no food system. And so, you know, we've, we've got to make sure that we start there. We've got to protect that core and we've got to make sure that we are able to grow our food system in such a way that it is increasingly more and more sustainable. Here in the U.S., 96 percent of dairy farmers are still family owned. So this is still mm. an industry that is driven by family owned farmers mm. who, as Robin said, they get up every day. They get up every day and try to make things better for the next generation. And so I think we've got to start with that core belief that. Nobody's out there trying to do bad. We're all trying to do what we think is right. Um, and if we can sort of meet in the middle on that, um, mm. politics is probably a bad analogy, but if we could get to that centralist sort of yeah. run, then there's a lot more we can do. And I welcome the opportunity to talk with anyone about what we're doing in dairy. That's great, Donald. Robin, what are your thoughts? Fostering more um, dialogue. Very quickly, the problem is huge. And what, what we know is that diverse systems are strong systems. So we do need that diversity of perspective. But we also understand that there is no one size fits all. So we need local groups understanding where they are, where their food is coming from, and how can that be most sustainably produced, sourced, and nutrients recycled. We need to talk about nutrient recycling as more and more people are now living in cities that's a drain on these mm. key nutrients. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Thanks to you, Jess, and to all the panelists and to the participants. And Laura, final 20 seconds. How do we find uh, 20 more seconds? <laughs> this, this webinar is an outstanding example of how you foster that open dialogue and making sure people have online access to these different voices. Mm. Secondarily, I would say just be more inclusive go beyond high income countries and think about nutrition equity and perspectives across different contexts um, and across different players. Thank you very Great. much for, for this Thank invitation. You. Thank you all. Thanks for the amazing contributions and your willingness to have this dialogue across differences. Please keep tuning in. The Columbia Climate School will have more of these seminars um, to tune into across various topics that touch on climate change and what we call everything change. Everything is being impacted by climate and there's a lot of dialogue across differences to be had. So please keep tuning in and thank you again to the panelists and to the audience for joining. Have a great rest of the week.
Thank you so much.